Chapter 3. The Ghassanids, Sons of Gassan. Judge not, that ye be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged, and with what message ye meet, it shall be measure to you again. Matt 7.1-2 In the morning after the birth of his son, Gershon called on Kotha. The two men had sensed the day of their departure was near. Merari joined them outside Gershon's house. It is the end of our journey here, isn't it? Gershon asked Merari. Yes, it is, Gershon. Leah will rear your son well with your help, and both will bring him back to the southern Arabian peninsula, the Levant region, where he will reign among his peers as one of the Ghassanid kings. He is the son of Ghassan, same as you are, and same as the many men who will follow. What about his religion? Gershon asked. He, your son, that is, will remain faithful to the only god he knows, although the family originally practised polytheism. Most of the Gasson family members have remained Christians throughout the centuries. The Gassanids generally did not accept Islam. Only a few became Muslim following the Islamic conquest, but most Gassanids remained Christians and joined the Meltic Syriac communities. After settling in the Levant, the Gassanids became an allied state to the Eastern Roman Byzantine Empire. They fought alongside the Byzantine Empire against the Persian Sassanids and Arabian Lachmids. After the fall of the First Kingdom, the Ghassanid dynasty ruled other realms, both Christian and Muslim, until 1747 AD in Mount Lebanon. What happened then? Kotha asked. The last rulers to bear the titles of raw Ghassanid successors were the Christian sheikhs Chamor in Mount Lebanon, ruling the small sovereign Sikdom of Zagara Zaya until 1747 when he died. But I thought the Ghassan family still lived today in Brazil, such as it says on the royal appointment. Yes, Gershon, they do, but the last member to rule over a kingdom was Sheikh Selim, or Yusuf Shemor. Is that when they moved to South America? Kotha asked. Not quite. It took the family another century of exile before they finally emigrated to Brazil. After 13 centuries of Muslim persecution in the Middle East, Sika Fares Faros went to Brazil in the 17th century and was registered as Faris Gurios. Since the immigration clerks used to write whatever they understood about foreign names, usually the Portuguese exact phonetic transliteration. Murari paused and smiled to the two men before he added, I think it would be a good idea for us to do the same. What do you mean? Gershon flared. Not to worry, son. As you said, your journey in this period of your past ends here and now. We shall return to your present so that we can read a little more of your history. Good Lord, Damianos, Gustavo said as soon as he regained his seat in the den of Dan's house. I don't think I'll ever get used to these leaps in time, as I recall you once told us, he frowned. Or was it Chippewa who told us that we needed to pace ourselves during these travels? Damianos laughed out loud. Yes, Chippewa must have told you that, and it is true, but in this case, and once again, I need to remind you that we are not travelling per se. In fact, we are simply revisiting places where you live, Dan, and re-entering your ancestors' existence without leaving this house. Do you mean we're actually dreaming these visits, as you call them? Dan asked after he regained his own seat across from Damianos. No, Dan, you're not. We are not dreaming anything. We abandon our bodies for a while and follow our spirits down your ancestral road. However, since you are in limbo, so to speak, Dan, executing an order of atonement, you are literally transported to the places where God wants you to be. What about me? Gustavo asked, seemingly puzzled by Damianos' explanation. By Damianos' explanation? You have exited your body already, Gustavo. You are the personage of yourself, but only your spirit is visible. Gustavo pondered Damianos' answer for a moment before he said, There is something that truly piqued my curiosity during this, last, this latest visit. Was I really Gershon's brother, or was that a personage I adopted for the time of the visit? Very good, Gustavo, and yes, you've guessed it. You were Dan's brother at that time. Are you serious? Don't sound so surprised, Dan. We are all descendants of Abraham, are we not? Therefore it follows that we have been siblings at one point in our ancestral lives. But you, you are still a shepherd. Damianos chuckled and seemed quite amused for a long moment. You mean I am still the tabby cat your family met during your last journey? Well, I was thinking more of the cat I saw in Pahoki. My spirit is that of a man, Dan, even though I occupy the body of a cat from time to time. All right, let's get back to the Ghassanid's history. Dan said, shaking his head. Because this is getting a little too confusing for me. Hmm, yes, of course, Damianos replied, taking Dan's book from the coffee table and opening it. I think you should read this page. He pointed to it. It will give you a very good idea of your early ancestral lineage history. He handed the book to Dan. 
The latter read the several paragraphs aloud while Gustavo closed his eyes to listen. As you know now, the Gassanids' kings came from the royal family of Saba or Sheba from this city of Marib in Yemen. There was a historical dam in this city. However, one year there was so much rain that the dam was carried away by the enduring, ensuing flood. Thus, the people there had to leave. The inhabitants immigrated, seeking to live in less arid lands, and became scattered far and wide. The immigrants were from the southern Arab tribe of Azd, the Kalan branch of Quatani tribes. Several scholars agree that the Emperor Philip the Arab was descendant of the Ghassanid royal family. It's known that he had royal blood even before he became emperor, and his homeland was exactly the first Ghassanid settlement in present Syria. According to one of the greatest Arab historians of the 17th century, the Christian Maronite patriarch Stephen el Dufay, Shemur had several marriages with the Hashemites during the 13th century. Therefore, even being Christian for over 11 centuries, the family is related by blood also to the Islamic prophet Muhammad. Therefore, the current Ghassanid family is also related to the royal family of Jordan and the exiled family of Iraq. Dan stopped reading and raised his gaze to Damianos. Both men exchanged a glance before Damianos inquired, What's on your mind, Dan? You seem bothered. I don't know that I particularly enjoy learning about family, about members of my family being issued from Islamic ancestors. Ah, yes, but one cannot choose his or her parentage, can one? Damianos held Dan's gaze. And I believe one of the first virtues that you and your wife learned about during your original trip down to your past was tolerance, was it not? Yes, I can remember our visit of St. Mary's Church in Pahokee very clearly, and the priest showing us images exemplified in tolerance at its worst. Exactly, Dan, the only thing perhaps worth remembering is that Islam is a religion born from a dispute. What does that mean? Dan queried. As in many cases amongst religious adherents to one faith or another, there are always rebellious figures or men who are no longer willing to follow the precepts of God as originally told by the scribes of ancient times. These men are expressing their faith in God differently, perhaps, and assign their brethren the title of infidels. However, God himself in his wisdom will recognize a man or woman who belied him or denied him just recognition. It is not for us to judge, Dan. Your ancestor did what they thought was best at the time. Tolerate your ancestry and your family, son, for who they are today and who they will become with your guidance. If they transgressed in the eyes of God and only in his eyes, he will be there to sit in judgment when the time comes. In other words, I should let it be, is that right? Yes, Dan, let the past be the past. You are to relive those lives in times of peace or in times of war, only knowing that your steps are the steps the Lord has chosen for you to take. The three men fell silent for a moment until Gustavo asked, I thought I heard you mention the name Philip the Arab. Wasn't he one of the Roman emperors? Very good of you to remember your schooling, Gustavo, Damino said, but it will also be good to remember that at the time he reigned over the Roman Empire, his moniker referred only to his place of birth, not to his religion or faith. He paused and looked at Dan and Gustavo in turn. I am mentioning the fact because he, in the present day, many people equate Arabs to Islamic believers, which is erroneous, and in the second century AD, Islam did not exist such as we know it today. Was he Christian? Do we know? Dan asked. I believe your book will tell you something about his faith and his descendants, but before we continue reading, perhaps I should like to mention something that you will need to remember. As cited in your book earlier, many Ghassanids sought refuge with the Syrian Melkites. These Melkites were some of the first Christian priests of the Middle East. Today they are still priests governed by the Roman Catholic Church. Perhaps the relevant difference to be mentioned here, Dan, is that they are the only priests of the Holy Church to be allowed to marry. Really? Gustavo said, quite taken aback. Is that recent, or has it always been that way? No, it's not recent at all. The Melkites have always been allowed to marry. No Roman pope would ever contravene that order. They are amongst the most respectable priests in the church. They generally sit in all of the synods that have been held. Are there any Melkites in my lineage, then? Dan asked. Quite possibly, yes. You see, when the flood inundated the city of Myrab, your family fled to Syria and took refuge among the Melkite settlements. It is also possible that members of the Ghassanid family at the time married Syrian Melkites. Another thing to consider is that, unlike many pre-Islamic Arab tribes, the Ghassanids were not pagans, but Christian members of what later came to be called the Syrian Jacobite Church. It was, in fact, through the personal intervention of Al-Harith ibn Jabalia, Jabala that Yaqib Qobbar Adai better known as Jacob Baradius, whence the term Jacobite, was consecrated Bishop of Edessa 
for the provinces of Syria and Mesopotamia in 542 or 543. The rigidly monotheistic doctrine of Syrian Christianity probably helped to prepare the Arabs of Ghassan for the arrival of Islam very soon after al-Harith ibn Jabala's death in 569. Many Christians and families in Lebanon, Jordan, Syria and Palestine trace their roots to the Ghassanid dynasty. The religious backgrounds of these families tend to be either Greek Orthodox or Greek Catholic, and some are Maronite Catholics despite the Ghassanid's non chalcedonian Syriac Orthodox religion. And now to return, turn to Philip the Arab, Daminos went on. As your book described, he was the first royalty to settle in today's Syria where he established the first Ghassanid settlement. Dan nodded. Sounds as if my whole family originates from the Middle East, doesn't it? And when did he go to Rome then? Well, Marcus Julius Philippus, Augustus as his name would read at the time, didn't live a long life. He died at the age of 45 in 249 AD after a reign of only four years as a Roman emperor. He acceded to the throne upon the death of Georgian III, and as soon as he assumed power he managed to negotiate peace with the Persian Sassanid Empire. The peace settlement removed a thorn from the Roman Empire's side, one which had seen many losses of lives over years of battles, if not centuries. That's quite something, Gustavo remarked. For someone to step into power and with such a short reign negotiate the peace that couldn't be achieved for the years of fighting, I couldn't see the leaders of today achieving the same feat in such a short time. Was he a Christian since he lived among the Christian Melkites of Syria where he was born? Dan asked. Well, Philip claimed to be a Christian convert, which would have made him the first Christian emperor. However, most historians disagree with that proposition. He had the reputation of being sympathetic to the Christian faith. That is a documented fact, yes, but when he suddenly... But when he supposedly tried to celebrate Easter with Christians in Antioch, the bishop of Babylus made him stand with the penitents. Maybe he wanted to assert his faith or declare his adherence to the Christian religion of Antioch, but wasn't accepted, Gustavo suggested. That's a possibility too, Daminos agreed. Nevertheless, the only fact of which we can be certain, or a fact that had been documented, is that Philip the Arab was sympathetic to the Christian faith. 